Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our webinar today with Dr. Erin McCallick. Dr. McCallick is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. Her research interests are in bipolar disorder, quality of life, knowledge translation, self-management, e-health, seasonal and non-seasonal depression, and assessment scales for mood disorders. Her research has been supported by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, the Michael Smith Foundation for Health Research, and the Canadian Psychiatric Research Foundation, amongst others. She is the founder and leader of the collaborative research team for the study of psychosocial issues in bipolar disorder, crest BD, a CIHR funded Canadian published over or network designed to foster psychosocial research and knowledge translation in bipolar disorder. She has published over 80 scientific articles and several books and book chapters. She lives on the sunshine coast of British Columbia, where she is an avid mushroom hunter and breeder of giant schnauzers. Today, um, Dr. Mikulak will share findings on the impact of the webinar, video, and workshop engagement strategies and speak to lessons learned from the project about the most effective ways to share health information with people with bipolar disorder. And what I should have said first was um, the Crest BD Bipolar Wellness Center launched on World Bipolar Day last year this site that provides people with bipolar disorder access to tailored evidence and tools to optimize self-management. Welcome, Dr. Michalek. Thank you, Debbie, for that lovely introduction. It's wonderful to be joining you all this morning and to have so many people on the line for this session. Uh, a note for people who are also joining on social media, we'll be live tweeting through the event from the Crest BD Twitter handle, which you can see right here. So just to orientate you a little bit, um, these are my offices here in the center of the UBC campus. I think this is my building right here. Uh, this picture was obviously taken in the summer in Vancouver. It looks nothing like this today. I'm looking out of my office window and it's gray and wet and dreary. Um, but that's the wonder of webinars. We can all join together today and hopefully you're, uh, I don't know, it's 9 o'clock here in Vancouver. So maybe you've just got your first cup of tea of the day and you're nice and cozy and warm. So this is the uh, overview of how I'm going to spend my time with you this morning. I'm going to give you a bit of an orientation, first of all, to some key concepts in bipolar disorder research. I'm going to introduce two products from the Crest BD network to you, um, a tool for measuring quality of life and the Bipolar Wellness Center that Debbie mentioned in the introduction. And then we're really going to get to the crux of it. I'm going to describe the four strategies that we've embedded within this new website to really help people access the best of the science that we have on living well, self-care, and self-management in bipolar disorder. I'm going to share new research findings, new data um, from, this is actually for the first time, so this is an exciting day. I'll be sharing data on the impact and effectiveness of three of those strategies. And then I'm going to reflect at the end on some of the lessons we've learned more broadly around effective engagement of people with bipolar disorder online, on websites, and in online communities. So to, to this point uh, of orientation, first of all, I wish I had more time with you today because I'd love to be able to spend uh, 30 minutes or so describing where we're at with these two key research areas that Crest has focused on that is the study of quality of life and bipolar disorder, and the study of how people can really effectively self-manage or self-care for the condition. But just to touch on those lightly, first of all, this is what we see if we look broadly at the research that's happening internationally in the area of quality of life and bipolar disorder. Uh, this comes from a paper that Dr. Greg Murray and I published back in 2012, but the graph you can see there is actually uh, looking at all publications on the topic of bipolar disorder and quality of life up to 2015. And what you can see really is a fairly exponential growth curve in this area. Essentially, this tells us that there's real increasing interest in, internationally in the research community in 
studying quality of life, studying the impacts of treatments for bipolar disorder on quality of life, and how quality of life is impact is great for us and great for people who are living with the condition because we know that it's a critical outcome measure and uh, something that we really need to focus on in the research world. We see something similar um, in the self-management realm. There aren't as many studies focusing on self-management of bipolar disorder, but there's lots of increasing interest in this area as well. Uh, this slide that I'm showing you now dates back from a study that we conducted back in 2010. This was one of the first studies specifically in bipolar disorder that looked at the self-management or self-care strategies that people use to live well with a condition. Um, this was an interesting project in that all of the people in it uh, were flourishing with their bipolar disorder, they were functioning really well, they were functioning well at work or in their family lives or in their social lives. And so it took kind of a positive or rec recovery focus to look at the relationship between self-management and quality of life and health in bipolar disorder and some of the key strategies that people are using and applying in their daily lives. Now this is just one example of one study. Um, there's a, a, a rich kind of uh, growing interest in this area internationally. And we're really at the point in the research world where we have very good data to share now on self-management strategies that we think actually that we know are effective in bipolar disorder for warding off, warding off episodes of depression, warding off episodes of hypomania and mania. However, there are still some significant gaps in the quality of life and self-management fields of research. And we've been trying to plug those within the CREST BD team over really the last decade or so. One of the key ones that we faced initially when we began research in this area was that there was no specific or special measure or assessment scale for quality of life in people in bipolar disorder. Now, when you look at quality of life in bipolar disorder, it's probably very similar in some ways to quality of life in people who aren't living with a mood disorder. So there are certain aspects of quality of life that are going to be important for most of us, things like physical functioning, social life. However, we do think that perhaps bipolar disorder is, um, you know, it's, a, it's somewhat unique as a condition and that it probably has some very specific impacts on quality of life. And there was merit to developing a questionnaire designed specifically to assess quality of life in bipolar disorder. The other gaps that we were seeing was that there really wasn't any integration between quality of life measurement or assessments and this idea of self-management. They were really happening in, uh, or growing as disparate fields. And then perhaps most importantly, we were lacking information on once you have good evidence about quality of life and self-management and bipolar disorder, how do you get it into action? How do you get it into the hands of people who are living with bipolar disorder on a day-to-day -day basis? How do you get it into the hands of healthcare providers and into the hands of support agencies like the International Bipolar Foundation? The first thing that we did back in 2010 after several years of research was published a, was published a paper and pencil version of our new quality of life scale for bipolar disorder. Um, it was, it's a good scale, it works well psychometrically, it does what we would expect it to do as a condition specific scale. That is, it's more sensitive to change over time and it's more sensitive to change in treatment interventions in people with bipolar disorder than when we use scales that have, for example, been developed for people who just have depression. So we were feeling pretty smug at this point. We thought we had done what we needed to do. Of course, uh, for any of you who work in the online or e-health or m-mobile health realm, you're going to know what we re recognized fairly quickly, which was that there was another gap that needed to be filled, and that is that uh, we needed to get this scale online into, into the online environment so that it could be conducted by people on the web. So at this point, I'm going to move away from the PowerPoint slides and I'm going to show you the two tools that we developed. Um, the first of them that I'm going to show you is the quality of life tool. You may have seen this already. Um, it's been available since World Bipolar Day on March 31st, 2015. I'm going to walk you through it uh, fairly quickly just to give you an idea of what it looks like. You have the choice initially of registering with the system, which means you can save your data or information over time, 
or you can just try it out, which doesn't require you to give any private information. Now, the quality of life scale, or the QualBD, um, measures quality of life in 14 different areas. One of those areas is work, one is school. Gives you the question, first of all, about whether you're actually in work or in school. Um, I'm going to say that I'm not currently, and it's going to give me, therefore, the 12 remaining domains or life areas to work through in terms of quality of life. So this is the physical domain. This is the sleep domain. You'll see that there are standard response formats for each of these questions. So it goes from a standard Likert scale, from strongly disagree to strongly agree in each of these areas. So right here, for example, I'm saying that really I'm struggling right, right now with my cognition. My leisure life, however, is fine. My relationships I'm really struggling with. And you'll see what's happening as I work through the scale is that you have a graphic on the right-hand side building, which is illustrating the areas of quality of life that you're flourishing in, that you're doing just fine in, and the areas perhaps that you're struggling in or you might need to pay some attention to at this point. My home life, the self-esteem area, you could also really call this a stigma domain. Independence, this is one that's often important for people who are newly diagnosed with bipolar disorder, youth with bipolar disorder. Same with the identity domain, really that's around who am I, you know, outside of my diagnosis of bipolar disorder. So I've worked through now those uh, 12 domains, uh, 56 questions in total, but slightly fewer if you're not answering the questions around work and school. And this is how I did. So this is my CRESPD account. What I could do if I wanted to was click on this link and have a look at my graphs and quality of life scores over time. So these are all time points where we've completed the questionnaire previously, and if I slide the bar across, what I can see is how my scores are changing over time in each of those areas. One of the important things for you to know around the quality of life tool is that it essentially serves as a gateway into the next thing that I'm going to show you, which is the Bipolar Wellness Center. Before I show you that section, I'm just going to walk you through uh, what else it provides in terms of your feedback, what you have here is all of your numerical scores in each, each of those areas. Um, up at the top here is a letter, which is designed as a letter for your clinician or healthcare provider that you can print out as a PDF or then share by email, so that you can actually use this as a conversation with your therapist or with your support people as a, you know, around quality of life and bipolar disorder and areas that you might want to focus on. Within the tool, there are also a number of videos that you can download around how to interpret your results and apply, apply them. Now, I said that this quality of life tool essentially serves as a gateway into the Bipolar Wellness Center. What I can see here is that I was really struggling in these areas with the shorter bars. The closer you are to the center here, the more you're struggling in there, these areas. So you can see, for example, that in the domains of sleep, cognition and my home life, I was really, really struggling. And if I was to click here on this sleep section, it would take me, gateway me, right into the sleep section of the Bipolar Wellness Center. So let me show you what that center looks like. This is the home page for it. You can see that it's really built on quite a strong nautical theme. Uh, this comes from many community consultations we've done in bipolar disorders research in CRESPD. The idea of finding balance between the waves of depression and mania, between the troughs of depression and the waves of mania and hypomania comes up again and again. Um, it's often likened as a process of kind of, you know, keeping an even keel amongst, uh, amongst the turmoil that the condition can be associated with. This nautical theme resonates throughout the Bipolar Wellness Center. The way that the center is structured essentially emulates the structure of the quality of life scale that I just showed you. So if I move away from the home page here into the different areas of self-management that the website focuses on, you can see that each of those 14 domains is laid out individually for you. So had I segued right from the quality of life tool into the Bipolar Wellness Center and clicked on that link into the sleep domain, for example, it would have brought me right onto this page which is where we summarize the best of the information that we have on the relationship between sleep and bipolar disorder. 
one thing I need you to know at this point is that um, there wasn't a quick process for us to develop this information. Almost a year of work went into each of these domains in a very community engaged manner with researchers, people living with bipolar disorder and um, other key stakeholders to determine the best of the science in each of these areas. So what we have here is in each section a summary of two to three pages of text. We've tried to make this as, as easy to navigate as possible for people. So what you'll see is that there are key messages around sleep and bipolar disorder summarized here, key ways that you can take action. Uh, you can click on an audio recording. So if you want to hear this text and cook at the same time or you know just do something else, you can actually hear a narration done by Victoria Maxwell, who lives well with bipolar disorder herself. Uh, describing this text. And then on top of that, there are a number of other ways we've tried to help people access this information here. So if you clicked on this section here, for example, what you would come to is a number of key resources for each area or concrete tools, essentially. Um, these are not obviously all of the tools around sleep and bipolar disorder. We went through a long process again of trying to cherry pick the ones that we think are most evidence based evidence informed or credible. Really essentially what we're trying to do is help people with bipolar disorder who are online, in online environments, to cut to the chase, to get to the best of the information that they need about in each of these areas. There's a lot of information on the web around health and bipolar disorder. Um, there are hard times navigating that sometimes and some of that information is uh, not helpful or downright dangerous. And so part of our job was to really help people navigate through to stuff that uh, we think uh, comes from good sources and um, is, uh, is well constructed. And so to go back to the previous page, you can also go through to things like polls, which show some of the self-management strategies that we've seen in our data are effective for each of these areas um, and a number of other key resources. There are also many videos on this site and sections developed specifically for healthcare providers. Um, but that isn't the focus of my talk today, really. What I'm doing now is getting to the crux of the presentation, um, which is describing the research that underpinned the Bipolar Wellness Centre. Funding for this project was provided by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research, that's the, the Canadian government, essentially. They wouldn't fund us just to build a website. What they were really interested in funding us to do was to look at the most effective strategies for people to access and use the information on, uh, on the Bipolar Wellness Center. And so this is the research underpinning the site that we've been really heavily engaged in in the last year. And we've essentially been testing out four different, we would call them knowledge exchange or knowledge translation strategies, four different methods for helping people to access that information. And I'm going to talk through these one by one. They're essentially webinars, videos, workshops and something called the Living Library. And so this is how the webinars look. What we did was we developed a fairly short webinar for each of those 14 domains. The webinars are about 15 to 20 minutes in length. One webinar covers one domain, so there's one on work and bipolar disorder, for example. Each webinar is either delivered by a Crest BD team member who's an academic, who's a specialist in that area, or a peer researcher in the network who has significant knowledge and expertise in that area. So, for example, the work webinar is produced by Dr. Raymond Lamb here at UBC, who's done a lot of work in mood disorders and work. The sleep webinar is produced by Dr. Greg Murray, who is one of the field's leading international sleep and bipolar disorder researchers. Uh, the spiritual webinar, however, was produced by Victoria Maxwell, who has a lot of lived experience expertise in the relationship between spirituality, stroke religion, and bipolar disorder. The webinars are structured around, they're all structured in the same way. Essentially, the first 10 minutes or so of the webinar covers the science in each of these areas. And then the second 10 minutes of the webinar covers concrete tools and strategies that people can use to improve their self-management in each of these specific areas. There's a question and answer session that happens and they're all downloadable um, or viewable within the Bipolar Wellness Center itself. But these were tested out within a research study. They're openly available now but were tested out initially within a research project. 
The second thing that we tested was videos. So these videos are shorter than the webinars. They're about two to four minutes each. We produced six of them initially. We're just in the throes of producing three more right now, actually four more, which are in the areas of uh, school and bipolar disorder and work and bipolar disorder. But the ones that we've tested out and produced um, initially were in the areas of physical life, money and bipolar disorder, mood, home life, social life, and sleep. In terms of the way that they're um, structured, uh, they're quite uh, focused on concrete things that you can do in your daily life. They all feature Victoria Maxwell, one of our core peer researchers with bipolar disorder, um, who, as I said, lives well herself with bipolar disorder. And they really kind of demonstrate in very, a very quick, hopefully accessible way, the way that you might apply some of these self-management strategies in your own daily life. The next thing that we tested out were workshops. Now these were much longer and gave us the opportunity to get more into the nitty gritty of uh, self-management in action. So they were two and a half hours in length. The way that we uh, designed them initially was that there were two quality of life domains covered in each workshop. So the ones we tested out as part of the research project, we developed content for the mood and the sleep areas. We actually um, delivered these workshops across a series of uh, events in collaboration with one of our key community agencies, with the, which is the Mood Disorders Association of Ontario. So we essentially toured these workshops around Ottawa, Kingston, and Toronto in June of last year. And they were structured in a different way from the previous stuff I've told you about, in that um, we had time in the workshops to get into things like role play, lots of question and answers, kind of didactic examples, the science, and so they were more hands-on and more intensive in terms of their design. The final thing that we are, we've launched and we're evaluating currently is this idea of a living library. Now this one's interesting in that it's a blend of an e-health or an online strategy and a face-to-face -face strategy. So the way that they're designed is that there is one 45-minute session that people with bipolar disorder can access. The Living Library session is delivered by a person who's a CRESPD peer researcher who's, again, living well with bipolar disorder, who's intimately familiar with the Bipolar Wellness Center. And the way it works is that the person, the, the Living Library user, does their quality of life tool shares that information with the expert that they're meeting, and then the expert tailors the information in the Bipolar Wellness Center according to their particular quality of life profile. So for example, if the Living Library user were struggling, for example, in the areas of sleep and mood, then the Living Library expert would review those results with the user, and then they would tour around what's available in the Bipolar Wellness Center and have a chat about how that might work in the person's life, problems and barriers to implementation, um, and talk about it, how it might work in the real world for them. All of this is delivered within a secure online system that's produced by a company called Medio, which is a essentially a, like a secure telehealth system. So um, it has dashboards and ways of sharing documents, and essentially gives you a safe and secure place to meet and to track, um, track the progress and outcomes from your meeting. So at this point in time, I won't have the data from this particular arm of the study to share with you. We recruited about 15 people for this arm, and then uh, we have a, another five or so to add in. And then we'll be complete with recruitment for the different arms of this project. So at this point, it's time for me to move on and actually show you some of the data that we have so far. This is how we've evaluated the impact of these four different interventions or self-management self -management interventions. We've taken what's known as a mixed method approach. Essentially what this means is that we're blending qualitative and quantitative methods. That means that we're using um, scales and surveys online, um, but we're also doing interviews with people as well. In terms of the quantitative or the numerical scales that we're applying, 
first of all, uh, these are done just before the intervention. So just before the webinar, for example, or just before the video, just afterwards, and then again at three weeks. We ask questions um, that are fairly, fairly general or around things like satisfaction with the intervention, um, self-efficacy, which is kind of around you know, feelings of self-control about your condition, whether you actually implemented it, whether there were any barriers around it. And then on top of that, we administered um, what we think were the most suitable scales for measuring change in this study. So we chose a generic, that is not bipolar disorder condition or bipolar disorder specific scale for measuring um, feelings of control and power over your condition. We've applied the quality of life scale that we've developed, a very interesting measure called the Bipolar Recovery Questionnaire, which is developed by our colleagues at the Spectrum Group at Lancaster in the United Kingdom. Again, this is condition specific. Uh, you should look into that scale if you're interested in measuring your own recovery over time. And then um, a measure of mood in the moment, essentially. So that everybody does these uh, quantitative or survey questions. And then a select group of the participants are invited to do an interview, <coughs> excuse me, over the telephone about three weeks after the intervention. And the interview is anal the, the data arriving, arising from these qualitative interviews is analyzed by something called somatic analysis. Okay, so what did we find? First of all, here are our recruitment numbers. If you look at the bottom line here, you can see that into those three arms of the study, webinar, video, and workshop, we recruited just under 90 people in total to evaluate that. Um, around two-thirds of them were women. Just over half of them had a diagnosis of bipolar disorder type 1. The rest of them, bipolar disorder type 2, were not otherwise specified. And according to the different arms, there was a preponderance of people generally in this kind of 45 to 55 age range. The age was somewhat sam smaller, or sorry, lower for the webinar sample. And these are the results. Don't worry, I'm going to walk you through this table in detail and help you unpack it. Um, and I've actually kind of shaded out areas of it um, to help us through that process. The area that I want to focus on, first of all, are these right-hand columns over here. So do you remember I told you that we had administered um, satisfaction questions around each of these different interventions? These are the results from that. Um, so you'll remember that they were assessed by a Likert scale where uh, lower scores indicate that people um, were more satisfied with the intervention. Higher scores going up to five would indicate that they were less satisfied with that particular intervention. And these are the different groups that we were assessing, the workshops, the videos, and the webinars. Now, first of all, look at this line down here. What we see when we combine all of those groups is quite positive overall. We can see that generally people thought that they learned something new in the interventions, that it was applicable to them, that it met their expectations, and that they would recommend it to somebody else with bipolar disorder. So those are the results for all three of those arms together. When we look at them separately here, though, this is where the data starts to get interesting. When we analyze this statistically using something called ANOVA, what we can see is that there is a statistically significantly higher satisfaction with the workshops than, with the, than the videos or than the videos. So remember, the workshops were in person, the videos were online, the webinars were online. Treat this data with some caution. This is a pilot study. The numbers are relatively small here. There are enough for us to detect significant differences. Um, but really what we're just seeing here are the significant hints, but hints in the data that there is, broadly speaking, um, higher preference towards workshop delivery than video delivery or webinar delivery of, of uh, self-management information. There are going to be health economic implications of this, of course, in that those workshops are more expensive to deliver. But maybe we can talk in the Q&A at the end around the idea of peer support models or organizations like the International Bipolar Foundation actually taking the content that we've developed and delivering it through their own systems and support structures. Okay, so those are the satisfaction scores. Here we get to the scores in the quantitative scales. You'll remember that we measured quality of life, bipolar recovery, 
mood. Again, this is a mood measure, and this is that chronic disease management scale. And what you can see over here is that uh, the uh, plus signs uh, indicate that there was an improvement generally in the numerical scores. Negative side signs indicate that there was a deterioration over time. And what you're looking for in terms of significance is these stars here. So let's have a look, first of all, at quality of life for the combined data. There was a trend towards significance, almost reaching significance, but not quite. A trend towards significantly improved quality of life in all of the interventions combined over time. There was a highly significant increase or improvement in recovery after the interventions across when all of the different interventions are combined. There were numerical um, improvements, but not statistically significant improvements in mood. And there was d a deterioration, a small but significant deterioration in people's um, feelings around their self-efficacy to, to, um, to uh, manage their chronic mental health condition over time. So that's the data for, the com for them combined. When we start to unpack that a little bit, what we see is that the workshops significantly improved quality of life, and yet the webinars significantly imp improved subjective, subject, subjective perceptions of recovery. Again, very small samples here, so treat with some caution, but we're getting hints that are going to be incredibly interesting to unpack around the differential impacts of these kinds of interventions for people's um, mood, wellness, and quality of life. Now, I had told you that this was a mixed method study. The numerical data is great. It's encouraging. It shows us at least that what we're doing is having impact in the right direction. Um, however, the meat of what we're learning about this study really comes through the interviews. Um, what we've done so far is actually a fairly large sample for a qualitative study. We have interviewed 36 people. I need to say at this point that this data has all been produced and analyzed within a team, but led by Emma, who's, uh, research, who's uh, the research um, student of Greg Murray in Australia, who's done a wonderful job of really uh, in-depth interviews with people after they've had these interventions and exploring their, ex their perceptions of that. And here's some of the stuff that we've heard so far during these interviews. This is the kind of uh, interim results from that somatic analysis. First of all, we've heard that people are applying the information that they've gained through the different interventions. They're sharing it with other people. Um, interestingly, they're sharing it not just with their clinicians, but also with their loved ones, with their support systems, in support groups. So there's this kind of rolling effect of knowledge translation and exchange that we're seeing. We've heard fairly clearly that this idea of no one size fits all. So while the videos um, uh, may be particularly um, attractive to some people, say for example you're struggling with concentration problems, you're just coming out of a severe mood episode, maybe for you at that particular point in time a two minute video is just what you need. Um, and a 20 minute webinar or a two hour workshop wouldn't be something that you would be interested in or could, could avail yourself to at the time. What we're seeing is that in terms of appetite for different e-health interventions, um, there really isn't you know, a standard uh, cookie-cutter approach that you can take. I'm going to speak a bit more about that later on. Mostly, we heard that there was positive impacts of um, the different KT strategies. Um, interestingly, impacts of the strategies themselves. So, for example, many people spoke around, well, it was great to see the video, or it was great to be in the workshop because I felt less alone, or I could see that other people were experiencing similar issues as me, or it decreased my feelings of social isolation. On the negative side, we did hear, however, that some people thought that our presentations of bipolar disorder, because they're so focused on recovery and flourishing, didn't cover the whole spectrum of the condition, and that they would actually um, uh, have poorer self-reflections self or perceptions because they were comparing themselves, for example, with Victoria Maxwell, who was flourishing in certain scenes in the videos. Real important take-home message for us. 
One of the strongest themes that's come through from this qualitative data so far, however, is around benefits of research participation itself. This idea of giving back to others, about having learned a lot with bipolar disorder over the years, and the need to pass that on, almost like a social responsibility to engage in research and to help other people um, cope with the condition on the basis of the knowledge and the expertise, the lived experience expertise that you've gained. Here are some of the quotes from that. So in terms of the workshops this participant said, I think being with other people who are dealing with similar health issues or problems, I think that's kind of reassuring to know that you're not the only one. On the topic of webinars, this participant said, then I saw the other people on the right, like on the column on the right that you have on your webinar panel here, the people who'd signed in and the comments, and so it said, well, you're in good company. You can do this, and you're doing things right. And on videos, they're so simple, and it's really easy to grasp the information. It really is just like, here are some things you can do, and it's as simple as that. It doesn't overwhelm you in the same way as here's a giant book. Read the whole thing. Okay, and so for the last five minutes or so, it's time for me to reflect on some of the lessons learned. This is where we get into the animal part of my presentation as well. Um, <laughs> these are, I'm a giant schnauzer breeder. Uh, these are some of the puppies that we've had over the past. And I'm using these images to kind of, as a metaphor, for the difference between theory and, theory and practice in e-health strategies. Now, in, e, in theory, when we develop an online application or a website or an app, um, we imagine that users are all going to be very well behaved and use our tools systematically in very kind of logical and ordered fashion. However, of course, there's often a big difference between theory and practice, which is a lot more random. Users use online tools and e-health applications in a multitude of ways. Um, this is really important for us to keep up front and center as we develop online applications for people with bipolar disorder. One solution to making sure that our e-health tools work in the, real world, in the real world is to make sure that we engage with real users right at the beginning and continuously and iteratively throughout the process. So before we even think about the tool that we're going to develop, is there a need for it? Is there a gap? Is there somebody else producing something? There are so many apps and tools available. Um, many, many of them aren't being evaluated systematically, and many of them have been developed without user engagement right from the beginning. Um, this is a problem. And so for example, in our quality of life tool project, um, we developed um, the tool itself on the basis of continual engagement with users. This is an example of one of the engagement days that we did before we started to think about what the tool would look like. These are the people who were engaged in that event, clinicians, people living with bipolar disorder, community agency representatives. And this is some of the stuff that we heard. So we gave our prototypes or our ideas initially to our e-health design team. And then we came up with these like, um, you know, prototypes for the output for the quality of life tool and how they might look. Of course, you know, typically you would see bar charts within science. This is another kind of graphical representation that you might see frequently. We gave these to the people at the consultation day and of course they ripped it apart and turned it into what you see in the quality of life tool now. Much more accessible and user friendly. We, of course, use the same model with all the videos that we produce. We show, we think about the content for the video before we develop it. We get people to look at the videos and uh, reconstruct them, essentially, after we've developed them or take bits out or add bits in. When we showed them the initial suite of videos for the quality of life tool, they, re they re-geared them totally and said, the first thing that people know when they access this video, the first thing that you need to say is, and this is how Victoria Maxwell starts out this particular video, is that good quality of life is possible for people with bipolar disorder. They were very clear, our users, that that recovery model had to be right up at the front. So going back to this idea of there being no one size that fits all, I mentioned earlier that um, there isn't a clear cut pattern coming through from our data around, um, you know, different uh, strategy about you know one of the strategies being particular particularly more beneficial for the group as a whole 
what we think really is most effective at this point is to move towards developing options, a palette of options for people um, who can access tools and resources at different points of time, at different points in the recovery process, according to the type of information that they want to get, the level of information, and how they want to receive that. Now, we are clearly seeing a leaning towards workshops from our data, that face-to-face -face piece. Having said that, we also see that with particular users, um, for example, that videos were what they needed at that time. Um, you know, the webinars were something that they really were taken to because of the way that that particular intervention was constructed. This idea of social connections, um, one of the most powerful things for us to harness within the e-health realm is the power of connecting people. It's going to be interesting for us to see the data come out from the living library intervention, which is, as I said, a blend of e-health and in-person connections. But if you're working in this area, um, do not underestimate the power of bringing people together to share information, to reduce stigma, to share experiences and real-world experiences of how things are working in terms of self-management and application of information in their daily lives. If we can blend um, online resource development and social connection, I think really that's where we're going to find the most bang for our buck moving forward in bipolar research in this area and care. Of course, as part of this, we really need to foster the power of connections with healthcare providers as well and really bring them as fully as possible into this conversation around quality of life and self-management. We don't see self-management as something happening outside of the healthcare system. Optimal self-management is going to be something that occurs ideally within the healthcare system itself and collaboratively with the person's healthcare providers should they have them. And so we've provided a lot of videos and stuff on the CRESPD website that unpacks how this might happen in the real world. And to my final slide, which is this idea of harnessing the power of altruism. Really, I wanted to end here because it speaks to that very strong theme that we saw coming through from the qualitative focus, the qualitative interviews that we did around the power of research participation and people's willingness to give to this type of research and the degree to which they want to engage with it. In CRESPD, um, all of the research that we do is done hand in hand with people who live with bipolar disorder. Um, it's an incredibly rewarding process. Um, I believe, I know that the quality of our research is vastly improved. It takes longer sometimes to work in this engaged way. But I really do believe that the quality of the science that we do is that much better for it. And if there's one kind of take home message from our work in this area is that people with, in the bipolar disorder community have a lot to give and they want to give of their experiences and the knowledge that they've gained over the years living with the condition. It's a critical resource and it's one that we should really be harnessing and taking full advantage of. And I will leave this up as we move into the Q&A section, but this is how you can access the Bipolar uh, Quality of Life Scale that I showed you, the Wellness Center, and keep in touch with us uh, through our social media and web-based um, connections. And really where I should end before we move over to the Q&A is just with a deep thank you to the International Bipolar Foundation. I spoke of the power of community agencies a couple of times during this presentation. IBF is um, seminal in this area. They really do some of the best work internationally in terms of helping with bi people with bipolar disorder, their family members and their healthcare providers get to great bipolar science and open up these conversations. So it's with huge gratitude that I join you for this IBF webinar today and get to share some of the very first results from our Bipolar Wellness Center project. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Erin, for sharing um, this information. Very interesting. And it looks like um, we have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, the first question is not necessarily about the research, but a question um, if you care to answer about um, treatment resistance and the drug ketamine. Any thoughts or comments? 
Yeah, it's hard for me. As I'm not an MD. I come from a psychology background, so it's not an area that I, I will get into in terms of the relationship between ketamine in particular and treatment resistance. Um, I will start with saying that I have a problem with the term treatment resistance, first of all. Um, I, th I find it kind of, you know, old-fashioned. Um, there are lots of people who have a complicated course in terms of their response to, response to different medications in bipolar disorder. Um, and uh, that's the nature of the beast in many ways. So I think that the field is moving on, I hope, from this term treatment resistance and just starting to think about the complexities of bipolar disorder and how it manifests. I'll also say as well that ketamine is a really interesting new area of pharmacological research. Um, the data is fairly new in the area, but is really intriguing. Um, I have uh, links that I can provide to some interesting ketamine studies that are, are occurring, and you have to feel welcome to drop me an email for those. Um, but I'm not, uh, I don't have enough knowledge to speak directly to the relationship between ketamine and BD. Great, thank you for taking that on, appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that this webinar um, is being recorded and will be archived on our website for future viewing or sharing with others. Um, we very much appreciate um, Aaron and Cress VD for what they are um, accomplishing. And oop, looks like the questions are coming in. Um, Can you please, um, next question is, can you please describe the concept of community-based participatory research? <laughs> well, thank you. It's a, it's a terribly wordy phrase, isn't it? Community-based participatory research. Essentially what it means, for us at least, in CRESPD, it comes in many guises and shapes and forms, is that uh, as far as possible, Everything we do in terms of research and knowledge exchange is done hand in hand with people with lived experience and with other stakeholders like clinicians and healthcare providers. Um, this means on the ground that, for example, when we decide in the network what areas we're going to focus on in terms of research, we, can, we engage with the community to figure out what those would be. So CREST, for example, has four areas that it, it prioritizes, stigma, quality of life, psychosocial treatments, um, and uh, self-management. Those were selected by the community as topics that needed to be focused on. Then when we actually do the research, we do it hand in hand with people with bipolar disorder. So they act as co-applicants and investigators on the funding that we hold. We contract them as peer researchers, they publish with us, present with us. It's fairly rare for me to present without somebody with bipolar disorder today as a bit of an exception, um, and then uh, help us move our findings into action. Community-based participatory research is a bit different from other forms of research because it's really kind of focused on having social impact and change and being having its feet in grassroots communities or in the community and keeping its feet solidly there so that the research you're doing is really flat, reflecting community priorities um, and has implications for the real world. Great, thank you for that answer. <clears throat> Excuse me, the next question, um, do you have a mobile app in the works? Mm -hmm. Center, et cetera. <laughs> Yeah, that's a question that comes up a lot. So we are currently collaborating with a research group to develop an app for the quality of life tool. Um, it's very early stages of development, but we've heard over and over again that this is an important next step for the project. It's very interesting how you fund these types of projects. Both of the projects behind the quality of life tool project and the Bipolar Wellness Center were funded by different grants from the Canadian government. Um, so you really don't have the latitude that you would have, for example, if you were working outside of a research study to do what are the obvious next steps in the project. So, you know, you have to look for other ways of funding those next steps. And, of course, the research that we do is quite intensive and in that, you know, I know perfectly well when we begin to develop that app that the first thing that we're going to need to do is go back to the community and say, okay, so where do we begin with this? How do we develop this app in a way that makes sense? Um, we've already done a lot of engagement, but it will all be, it's all iterative and continuous. Um, so each of our research projects is quite intensive in nature, um, and that has, uh, you know, cost and time implications, of course. But it's going to happen, and we, we think we've identified a good group to do it with, so we'll keep you posted. 
Great, excellent. Keep us posted. Um, next question, are clinical studies still being conducted? If so, where can those of us with bipolar um, find that information and help out? Sorry, Deb, Debbie, can you say the first bit of that question again? Sure. Are there are you still um, conducting clinical studies? And if so, where can people find Yes, them? yeah, we are. Thanks for that question. Um, so I said that one of the areas that we focus on is this idea of psychosocial treatments within the SPD network or interventions. Um, of course, you could have psychosocial treat interventions that aren't treatment per se. Um, I'm really happy to be able to share news that the Canadian, uh, sorry, the Australian research funding organization, a very large project called Orbit, uh, which is led by Greg Murray in Australia. Um, this is an online study as well. Um, it's four years of funding, and it's going to be really exploring the impact of different types of online interventions for people with bipolar disorder, um, an online psychoeducation intervention, and an online mindfulness-based intervention. You know what's really neat about this project and very different though as a clinical study is that it focuses on people who we would call late stage bipolar disorder. And essentially all this means is that they've had um, multiple episodes of depression or mania. So that's many people with bipolar disorder who have had 10 or more so episodes during their lifetime. However, one of the problems with bipolar disorder research or one of the gaps that we have now is that um, many of the psychological treatment studies haven't focused on people who have had lots of episodes or when they have focused on those groups they find that certain psychological interventions don't work as well for people who have had lots of episodes. This study is focused specifically on that population um, and again you can follow the CRESPD website to uh, get details of that. We're going to be developing the study over the next year and then launching it at the end of 2016, early 2017. Great, thank you for sharing. Um, the next question is, what do you feel is the most effective way to share one's personal experience or story? That's such a broad question, such a good question, but such a broad one, and it really um, comes back to you know where that person is in their life um, and certain considerations, like disclosure, for example, it's very interesting when you look at the discourse around bipolar disorder and stigma and that one of the things that we hear from some realms is the condition and talking to people about it. However, other people very rightly say that stigma is you know, still very prevalent in society and there may be ramifications for that in work. So your decision around you know, um, sharing information with others needs to be housed within that particular personal comfort level with disclosure. Um, you know, there's often a you know, ju judicial disclosure or seeking out particular people to share that information of, with a particular point of, at a particular point of time is a strategy that a lot of people choose rather than kind of, you know, a shotgun approach, approach of telling everybody all the time. Um, but there are many, many effective ways or methods for sharing that lived experience. Um, blogging is one of the most powerful of those. Blogging gives people an opportunity to reach very wide audiences. There are strong structures on the web, obviously, for supporting blogging and strong agencies that you can partner up with in order to spread the word of your experiences. Um, so I would suggest that really thinking about, you know, writing it down um, or visually capturing it. You know, of course, blogging, blogging is one way, but through art, imagery, metaphor, there are many ways as well for us to, to, for us to um, capture and share those lived experiences of bipolar disorder that are in that more kind of visual realm as well. Um, the web, of course, provides an ideal method for that. But as I said earlier as well, let's not forget about that face-to-face -face piece. Uh, many organizations um, across North America and around the world have wonderful peer support systems um, where you can connect with other people with bipolar disorder um, and if you've been around the block with the if you've been around the block with the condition a few times and have expertise to share, that can be a great place to support people who've just been newly diagnosed. Um, one of the problems I think with bipolar disorder literature and what's on the web is that much of it is focused on on um, the disability and the dysfunction associated with the condition. 
Um, this isn't that this isn't true or a reality. It is. But one of the things that we can do in terms of connecting with other people is to counter that. And we can do that through support groups and support systems in terms of like leveling that playing field and illustrating to people that there's a whole other side of the condition where we can live well, recover, have good quality of life and health. And there are, there are solid self-management strategies and treatment approaches to support that. Great. Thank you for that answer. Um, the next question is, what area within your uh, BDQLL um, do people have the most trouble with? <laughs> That's an easy question to answer. It's the spirituality domain. There are 14 domains, um, and the one around spirituality is the one that people struggle with the most. We often unpack this for people um, in that we explain that the questions in there aren't really, aren't, well, they're not focused on a formal religion per se. And that often, sometimes, when you're answering questions around spirituality um, and bipolar disorder, for some people, they don't have any kind of you know, spiritual identity or sense. But those people are more in a minority. Most of us have um, some understanding of maybe even if it's not spirituality, it's the sense of where we get meaning from in our lives the things that we value, perhaps a connection with something outside of ourselves. But it's actually taking it away from that formal religion piece. Of course, there are other people as well who find formal religion and um, religious practices incredibly helpful in terms of living well with bipolar disorder. But that's certainly the domain that people struggle with the most. What's interesting that's coming through from our data currently is that the domains that people are really wanting to focus on within our studies and within the living library are the domains around self-esteem, identity, and stigma. Um, and this really tells us, I think, that perhaps there's a lack of information available for people with bipolar disorder in those specific areas. There's lots on the web and available around sleep and bipolar disorder and mood and bipolar disorder. What we're hearing from our participants is that there's a real appetite for those more psychological or psychosocial realms and helping to understand what it means to have a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, for example, but for it only to be one part of who you are or how to have a healthy identity and sense of self within the realms of that condition. Wonderful, excellent answer. Um, it looks like that's all the questions that we um, have coming through at this point. But um, kindly, Erin did share all of her way, many ways to get in touch with her should you have a question at a later time. And we want to thank you so much, Erin, um, for allowing International Bipolar Foundation to be um, part of this. Um, study in that you have shared the initial concept and the follow-up, and we hope to hear more from you. IBF is a wonderful partner for us, and I look forward to many years of collaborating in the future. Thank you so much for having me today. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, and have a wonderful rest of your day.